Hi everyone. Uh, good afternoon and thank you for joining us. My name is Vidushi Mata. I'm a senior program officer um, at Article 19 where I work on artificial intelligence and machine learning and its impacts on, on human rights. Um, I'm just going to make sure that we have all our speakers. Yes, we do. Um, so we're ready to get started. Um, just to give you kind of a background on what this this conversation is supposed to be about. Um, when we talk about the AI Act, a lot of the conversation revolves around, you know, what kind of regulation we want, what kind of safeguards we need. And in this session, we're hoping to kind of talk about how do we ensure that some technologies that are fundamentally problematic or fundamentally dubious don't make it to the stage of deployment at all. Um, as I'm sure many of you know, the EU AI Act contemplates uh, currently a risk-based approach to regulating AI systems where we have some systems that cause unacceptable risks that should be banned and prohibited from being placed on the market. Um, other AI systems are classified as high risk that can be placed on the market subject to mandatory requirements. And then AI systems that pose limited risks that only have to subject themselves to uh, transparency obligations. So while this classification and this risk-based approach is a welcome one, uh, what we're finding is that there is kind of an inconsistency in how certain AI systems are classified under this particular schema, where, you know, things like emotion recognition and, and biometric categorization systems, for instance, are, you know, as we know, fundamentally problematic, inconsistent with international human rights standards, but are also currently considered limited risk. Um, so in today's session, we kind of want to explore what are the various arguments and strategies that we can and should use uh, when it comes to, um, you know, kind of engaging on these issues for civil society, what will lead to a more rigorous, consistent and critical classification of unacceptable uses um, under the current proposal. Um, and so before we get into uh, questions and hear from my excellent panelists, I just want to introduce the panel to you. Um, so the first speaker that we have is uh, Maria, Maria Luisa Stasi, who is my colleague at Article 19. Um, she works as the head of law and policy with a focus on digital markets, um, and her work contributes to the development of Article 19's policies on biometrics, AI, infrastructure, competition, um, and the regulatory framework for digital markets. She also provides legal support to Article 19's regional offices on digital rights and media policy issues. Welcome, Maria. Um, Daniel Leufer works as Europe Policy Analyst at Access Now's Brussels office. He works on issues around artificial intelligence and data protection with a focus on face and uh, face, facial recognition and other biometrics. He has worked extensively on the EU AI Act. Um, he's really a wealth of knowledge with a particular focus on prohibitions um, um, surrounding emerging technologies like emotion recognition and biometric categorization. Uh, thanks for joining us, Daniel. And finally, we have Professor Lorna McGregor, who is a professor of international human rights law in the law school um, uh, at the University of Essex. Uh, she's also the director of the Human Rights Big Data and Technology Project. Her current research focuses on data analytics and uh, emerging technologies like AI. She currently co-leads a project uh, that I'm also a part of that uh, is, is a real privilege to work with Lorna on to examine the case for red lines in technology design, development and deployment and to assess the most effective strategies for influencing law and policy at the international level, as well as in different national and regional contexts. Uh, so thank you so much for joining us. And uh, without any further ado, uh, I'm going to turn over to Isa um, by asking you a broad question, given your work on biometrics in, in the European context, um, which can, you know really involves a range of issues, whether it's biometric technologies or infrastructure or surveillance ads. Um, so when it comes to biometric technologies in particular, what would you say are the main challenges facing civil society in securing bans against Against these technologies that enable mass surveillance um, and also a violation of human rights, for example, um, like emotional recognition. Thank you. Thank you, Vidushi. And uh, hi, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, and uh, I'm so happy that this conversation is happening. Um, so um, as, a, as a way of introduction, let, let me take a little bit of a step back and, and look at a broad picture. I do believe that the, the, the main message to be given here is that when it comes to the advocacy in terms of biometric technologies, we're talking about something that is extremely complex and uh, the complexity has not uh, only 
know, necessarily a traditional policy and legal complexity, but it's also a technological complexity. So from the very beginning, the, the, one of the, the major obstacles that as civil society we have, we have to face and we have confronted, and many colleagues have done an excellent job in that, is uh, to sort of uh, try to figure out what exactly are we talking about. Um, so this, this is... Um, extremely difficult because as we all know it's uh, a sector that is uh, permeated by an information asymmetry so uh, there is not a lot of transparency it's super difficult to get access to the information we need to we need to we need and we want to have in order to properly shape our own ideas and advocacy calls um, so um, and, and this even if we had the technical background so you, you know you go figure if we don't even have that uh, the technical uh, background to start with um, it's not a case uh, I think that um, an, a good number of, of litigation about the uses of biometric technologies have started with access to information requests uh, you know a lot uh, about the, the level of lack of information uh, uh, and lack of transparency and I think this is a, a, a big obstacle that we can find equally in the public sector and the private sector there is not much difference unfortunately out there so I would say the first main obstacle for civil society is to try to overtake this information asymmetry uh, that it's um, it's absolutely um, uh, undermining every every further possibility uh, to properly act. The second one is to try also <laughs> to sort of uh, uh, identify the right actors to talk to uh, and the right language to talk to when it comes to, you know, you've mentioned already uh, emotion recognition and I know we had this discussion with a few of you and, and many more people. Uh, what do we mean about, what, uh, about emotion recognition? What are the definitions, with the workable definitions we're all using? Because we might end up having the same conversation again and again and again, but the premises are different because people use different concepts. Uh, so this is, I think, a second a major problem that we have when, when we call about bans or red lines, because we need to be convincing and we need to have that. Therefore, we need to have uh, exact information, shape our project, uh, our calls in a, in a very defined and targeted way. And so all those are essential elements that I, that I think uh, we need to work on, we've been working on, and, and some of us have done, as I said, a, a very great job about this. Um, there are, this is the pessimistic note. The op optimistic note, uh, it's that this has also provided the opportunity for uh, a variety of, of people from a different background to come together and try to shape those calls and especially when it comes to the bans uh, so we have uh, you know typical advocacy community and legal community and technical community coming together and trying to get to a proper uh, to put together a proper message uh, and, and a proper assessment of what what, what those uh, challenges are and why we need to go for it um, if you think about it, narrowing down to the EU, uh, this conversation has started a few years ago already. And at the very beginning, you might all remember that that the major, uh, the, the buzzword was ethical AI. So in this sense, we've gone a long way through, right? So uh, we have, we have I, I, I can, you know, confidently uh, say that we have abandoned the idea, at least, you know, uh, in certain parts of this conversation, we have abandoned the idea that an ethical framework could be sufficient to achieve our goals. And we have shifted this, this attention to a human rights framework and a human rights impact assessment and, and so on and so forth. So uh, this has brought us let's say, a little bit closer to the possibility to advocate for proper bans, uh, because bans in the ethical framework were extremely more difficult to introduce. Uh, yet, as you rightly spotted, Bidushi, there is a still a, a, a sort of resistance, um, because a ban comes together with a concept of an acceptable risk, and we still have a long way to go before we get to a consensus of what an acceptable risk means. Uh, I know uh, other people in this conversation are going to focus on the provisions of, of the AI Act when it comes to this, uh, these categories. But let me just say uh, that um, the, um, one, one, one of the elements that, that I think uh, uh, should be highlighted and is one of the dearest to me is that the unacceptable 
concept seems to be attributed to individual harm, uh, while here we're very much talking about societal harm or harm to uh, col collectives, communities, etc. And this is why, and I, th I see this extremely linked to the idea of having a ban for mass surveillance uh, and not for individual surveillance. Uh, I think another, let's say, major challenge that we are, we are facing as civil society in this in this environment um, is exactly this idea about resisting to a narrative that is widespread. Uh, so the, the mass surveillance in, in a vacuum, let's say, it looked like a bad concept. Uh, no one wants to have a system where everyone is surveilled. But the narrative that we've seen, and I think the, the, COVID, the, the COVID pandemic uh, has, has created even more momentum for this narrative to be, uh, let's say, introduced and affirmed uh, is um, the idea that, you know, there are uh, good, uh, good reasons why we should uh, give up our privacy or give up, uh, you know, our private sphere uh, in order to ensure security for a society or a societal level. Uh, or um, there has been all this this idea, uh, you know, this this um, uh, work streams on on tech solutionism. The idea that as long as, long as you, you know you have you have major problems, you can only fix with a number of different technological developments. Uh, I think. As, a, as an activist, uh, this has been one of the major problems to try to keep the general audience focused on the fact that uh, this extremely invasive uh, technologies uh, and especially um, irrespective of the specific use that is done um, in certain circumstances, they will uh, undermine our fundamental rights uh, if we are in the EU framework, human rights if we are, if we are somewhere else, uh, to uh, an extent that is unacceptable. Um, so that the proportionality and the necessity uh, that are, you know, the usual tests that we that we apply when, when it's about limiting fundamental rights uh, will never uh, be respected in those cases. Um, I am um, extremely convinced that we have done so far uh, a very good job in trying to resist this narrative, yet uh, it has been pushed from different ways and different stakeholders, so it's not necessarily easy. Um, and But I say, uh, you know, those, those are definitely the main challenges for uh, trying to, to um, call for such strong uh, acts, uh, putting red lines on what is uh, something that we don't want to have. If I have uh, other 30 seconds, I think the, the the last point I would like to make is that you also mentioned this video already. It's uh, this idea of, of trying to, to, to figure out, um, to, to expand the ban, not only to the specific a specific use of the technology, but to go all the way back and look at and explore uh, also, the, the idea of, of designing that technology, not only deploying it into concrete cases. Uh, I think uh, what I've said uh, so far, so the, 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 all the points, and especially the lack of transparency, is is, is um, it, it, it does concern also the design. And I think that there we're even farther uh, to the objective whether in the deployment or concrete use um, scenario because of the wording of the AI that, as we know, focuses on, on put into the market and practical uses, but also because we're seeing in Europe, at least in the European context, messages coming from different different places um, that go against uh, this uh, idea that um, research or design in itself should be or could be prohibited uh, in certain cases. Uh, I just mentioned the I border control case that you might are familiar with. I can I can discuss, you know, some details about that later on if we have time. But the main point is that it seems to me that the court in Luxembourg has, has um, uh, provided a message that is a very uh, worrying message for us uh, because it has said that basically the public interest in having transparency about the the development of of emotion recognition technologies uh, it comes only when it when it's the stage of deploying them and not at the stage of designing them and I do believe that we need to have a public debate starting way before the deployment and possibly also consider the idea of having bans way deploy way before the deployment stage uh, so yes it's a worrying message that comes from you know another institution so it, it, it sort of sends the water where we are and um, it means we still have a lot to do I guess <laughs> thank you so much Isa for for kicking off this conversation with so much rich um so many rich, rich thoughts um 
Daniel, um, I'd like to turn to you now, uh, especially given, you know, everything that Isa just said about how technologies are being classified and also how they're being conceptualized, not, not just by the regulation, but also by the courts. Um, could you talk a little bit about how you're thinking through these risk classifications, especially when it comes to technologies like emotion recognition? And what do you think civil society needs to be paying attention to at the moment? Uh, yeah, thanks. And yeah, thanks again to all the organizers and to Vidushi for organizing this session and the, the invitation. Um, yeah, I mean, and also um, really great introduction there from, from ESA. And I think uh, I'll definitely come back to some of the points um, that you raised. The first thing I would say is, and again, this is to pick up on one of ESA's points, we should be happy that we're not still having the ethics conversation. I think that's really a success from civil society. You know, since 2018, um, there's been initiatives kind of drawing critical attention to this ethics narrative. Um, and I think we were we were successful in pushing back on that. You know, we've had right from then things like the Toronto Declaration pushing for human rights standards um, in machine learning development. And it, it's really I share that feeling that the ethics uh, conversation is off the table and we're really focused on rights and, and regulation, which is a great place to be. The other thing that I think is a success, although I will qualify it success, is that there are prohibitions in the current AI Act. I think that was not guaranteed from the beginning and there was a lot of very hard work from activists, a lot of whom are, I see in the audience here, um, to get those red lines. Um, and so, yeah, we should all be very happy that um, that that's in there. Nevertheless, there's a lot of work to be done to actually ensure that those prohibitions, which are currently under Article 5 in the Act, um, are, if, are an effective way to protect people from, from what we're calling unacceptable risk. Um, the first issue and, and like inconsistency that I would point to, you know, th there's a, a clear conversation that people are having about the prohibitions that are in there are not great. They're badly framed on the remote biometric identification when there's too many exceptions to the extent that it looks like almost providing a legal basis for its use. Um, and there are things that should be in there that aren't in there, like emotion recognition, um, biometric categorization and certain uses. Um, but kind of beyond the question of fixing what's in there and adding other things, the fact that that list of prohibitive practices cannot be updated and does not have any criteria is very, very problematic. You know, if this risk-based approach were to be kind of really consistent and effective, and I will say as well that from the beginning, we, we were critical of taking a risk-based approach um, and pointed out some of the inherent problems with that. There should be a clear list of criteria for each risk level and some form of, you know, flagging mechanism to allow a re-evaluation of how a system has been classified so that it could, for example, be moved up. So say, for example, you've got some crazy stuff in Annex 3, which is the list of high-risk practices, including the use of AI polygraphs in a migration context, which for me is one of the clearest things that should be banned. Um, I think AI polygraphs across the board, but certainly in the context of migration, uh, should be prohibited. There has to be some way that a practice like that that is currently listed as high risk could be flagged for re-evaluation, evaluated according to clear criteria and moved up to the um, higher risk classification of unacceptable risk. So we're doing some work around that um, with Edri, with some other partners, Algorithm Watch, um, and then Edri members, um, including uh, Vidushi and Isa. Um, to, you know, th think about how we can open up Article 5 so that it becomes a, you know, a useful tool in the future that we can add new practices. I think there's complete hubris and delusion um, in the idea that that list of four badly defined practices uh, encompasses every single unacceptable risk that could be posed by an AI system. So that, that needs to be sort of loosened up so that it can become an effective instrument. Um, then, I mean, in terms of uh, biometric categorization and, and emotion recognition, um, I think Isa's point about definitions is really important. Uh, we've pointed out problems with the current definitions that are in there uh, since, you know, the initial 
launch of the act, both the definition of biometric categorization and the motion recognition are tied uh, to being based on biometric data, which is a problem because biometric data has, you know, two aspects to its definition. It's uh, data relating to the physical, physiological, or behavioral characteristics of a natural person, and it has to enable unique identification. Now, you can do biometric categorization and emotion recognition using physical, physiological, or behavioral data that does not meet the bar for identification. You know, you have crazy systems out there like gender recognition using nose sweat. Uh, and I don't know, I don't, I'm not sure if nose sweat meets the, the bar for unique identification, but also things like heartbeat, galvanic skin response. So the definitions need to be fixed um, for sure. But then we, we need to have a, a clear conversation about how we need to ban them. With emotion recognition, I think that's complex because the way emotion recognition as a term is used, both by industry and civil society, is extremely broad. It covers things like polygraphs, you know, the straightforward systems that kind of categorize facial expressions into discrete emotional categories of seven emotions based on like Paul Ekman's theory. But then I, when I mentioned that we're advocating for a ban on emotion recognition, someone brought up the example of a system that identifies if callers to emergency services could be having a heart attack. That's not emotion recognition. Uh, you know, there's no inference there from uh, biometric data to some kind of emotional state that's just detecting uh, stress. Levels. So we need to be careful about the definition uh, to be effective in, in really advocating for a ban. Um, I think uh, just to finish, um, I see I've got about a minute left. I do want to come to, to Sarah's point um, that she raised in the chat about, you know, how can we successfully mobilize against red lines that are primarily targeted as relatively underrepresented groups in our community? And I think this is a big issue. Um, you know, the stage we're at in the negotiations, we sort of depend on getting popular support, getting buy-in to the arguments that we're making about certain red lines. And unfortunately, that kind of depends on, you know, having some sort of a hook that gets people interested. And there is, as Sarah's question points out, an inherent conflict that if, you know, the majority of MEPs are kind of from middle class white backgrounds and not affected by these type of systems, maybe they're not going to get particularly engaged um, by these. And the same applies to, to activists as well. If, you know, you're coming from a background like mine, you know, then if only the concerns related to, to those profiles are raised, that's an extreme issue. Um, how to address that? I think, again, I would point to, I think Sarah, who asked the question, is doing incredibly good work on bringing in uh, organizations from outside the typical digital rights community, building bridges between different civil society organizations, um, and really the really important work of coordination so that uh, what might seem like marginal issues uh, get placed in the center. Um, and I think, you know, there's really important work going on there, but it's, it's certainly a challenge. And uh, yeah, I hope that we can ensure that, you know, all of these violations. And again, it, it's typically, if you look at biometric categorization as an example, um, I am probably not that likely to, to fall victim to the harms of biometric categorization. It's going to be people who don't fit a gender binary. It's going to be uh, people who could be racially profiled by a system like that. So we really need to ensure that, yeah, we do all that we can to get these systems prohibited. Thank you, Daniel. There's so much to to think about, and also so much to you kind of revisit uh, periodically, because we, as you said, right, there's so much that we need to build bridges um, for, and like think think really critically about, you know, who do we need in the room, and why, and what are the what are the limitations within our own communities. Um, and now I'd like to turn to Lorna, which actually this is a great segue because. Um, Lorna, in our work where we're looking at, you know, red lines for biometric systems, um, we've been talking to a lot of people from across the world. We're looking at different jurisdictions, all the way from, you know, um, Argentina and Brazil to India to, of course, the EU and the US. And um, I guess at this point, it's also helpful to think about, you know, what are the challenges that we've seen across the board when it comes to 
getting these deadlines in place? Um, what can we learn from those experiences um, that could be helpful in the context of the EU AI Act? And do you see there being kind of a push and pull um, when it comes to securing deadlines in one place um, as that being kind of like an encouragement to, to have it in more places, especially when we think about the companies that tend to, you know, um, pr provide this technology across jurisdictions? Yeah, um, thanks, Vidushi. Um, and as you say, this is our joint work, so um, please jump in, um, in um, as I'm talking. But um, I think that when we've been speaking to people um, in different jurisdictions, it's been really fascinating. And I think we've, we've learned a lot about the challenges and the strategies for securing um, red lines, as well as the obstacles. Um, I think sort of the first takeaway that we've had um, really um, aligns um, with Isa when she was talking about the information um, asymmetry. Um, and I think that what we've found um, in so many places is that it's really difficult to talk about red lines um, without knowing if, where and how biometric technologies are actually being used. And that seems to be a major continuing project for actors um, across a whole range of different jurisdictions. Um, and that is particularly when we're thinking outside of the law enforcement and facial recognition technology context. Um, so I think that that's a really important takeaway. And I think that it sort of um, dovetails with what Daniel was talking about in terms of what are we prohibiting, um, that there can be a risk that we really focus on what we know is happening, but there's so little transparency around what's happening with biometric technologies that we might just go for red lines that are too narrow and that may affect us down the line, particularly when we're talking um, about prohibitions that are quite um, narrowly set. Um, I think that when we think about this from sort of the EU AI Act perspective, what's really important there is also, it's not just the technology and the sector that it's being used and which technology, but there can also um, be a risk that we think about um, technologies that are being used in our own jurisdictions by global actors and we don't think about the transparency around how are those same global actors sharing, selling, offering the same technologies in, in other jurisdictions so that we think about how do we secure red lines here but not red lines um, throughout the whole global supply chain and the way in which these actors are maybe using them in different ways. Um, and I think that that's sort of a theme that comes out where we see certain actors committing to red lines in particular jurisdictions, committing to moratoriums, committing to bans, but we don't know if those same practices are happening um, elsewhere. So that transparency piece is so multi-layered and really um, affects how we think about red lines. Um, I think the other thing that we um, are really um, suffering from, which has already come up in the conversation, but many people have, have raised it, is that it's not easy to get political commitment to red lines regulation, particularly when we're talking about a ban as opposed to a moratorium, um, when you don't have these stories about how they're being used. So you lack these sort of personal stories um, about what's happening. Um, and then that makes it really difficult to actually get momentum for, um, for um, achieving red lines regulations. So I think that we find in many contexts that, that there's a lot of public and political and legal obstacles to securing red lines. But what has come up is that if there um, are, um, if there's momentum for regulation on red lines elsewhere, um, and obviously we've seen that um, in the US with the movements on moratoriums and bans on facial recognition technology, as well as now within the EU AI Act, where there is actually space and opening um, for red line regulation elsewhere, that that can provide a lever or an opening for actors to really advocate for um, the adoption of red lines. So where you may, within your jurisdictions, finding it really difficult to see where is there a space for this, if you see elsewhere um, and you can point to it, particularly if it's regional or international, if you can point to this is what's happening elsewhere, then it may help you 
um, with momentum in your own jurisdiction, particularly as we see pretty much um, all jurisdictions are having some kind of conversation about what AI regulation looks like, whether it is still just in the ethical regulation conversation or whether we're getting more to human rights compliant conversation about regulation of AI. There's some kind of conversation going on. And if you can point to, well, this is what the international best practice is looking like, it may provide some momentum, it may provide some advocacy tools, um, whether that's at the political level, the parliamentary level, or whether it's in courts, there may be some kind of momentum there. Um, it may also provide momentum for other actors, um, for example, talking to investors um, within major companies to say, well, look, it's not good enough if, you, if you're regulated um, in one jurisdiction um, or you've committed to red lines in one jurisdiction. This needs to be throughout your international practice and you can't be testing technology in one place while committing to um, a ban or a moratorium in another place. Um, but I think it's also important for us to think about what the extraterritorial effects of the EU AI Act may have um, for actors that are regulated with it um, in the way that we have that under the GDPR. So there's lots of ways in which we need to think about what are the effects um, of the EU AI Act and red lines outside um, of the EU. And I think that that really then comes um, to Daniel's last point, and maybe just to close, um, in case, Vidisha, you also want to, um, to elaborate on points. But um, what is contained within the EU AI Act is sort of one of the first pieces um, of regulation that will have red lines in it is, is really critical for what the rest of red line and AI regulation looks like. I mean, we've already seen this in relation to things like GDPR, that what is contained here, we have to be careful that the bar is not set so low that it becomes the model for other places. And so if we are worried about not only what is contained within Article 5, but also um, the idea that it can't be reevaluated and grow, but we're also still talking about very narrow contexts in which biometric technologies are used. We're at a real risk that we achieve red lines, but it sort of becomes frozen in time. And then as the information asymmetry is addressed and we start to understand much more about the impact um, of these technologies and as these technologies evolve, that we're kind of stuck with trying to, with a, a model that is, is not fit for purpose. So I think that we have to think in many levels about how we address um, red lines within regulation and how it affects um, other jurisdictions. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, Lana. I think the, the, the question of how do we future proof even perfectly, you know, in 2022, perfectly um, stated kind of prohibitions is, is a big question that Daniel also brought up. Um, the only thing I'll add is that, um, you know, in our research on emotional recognition in China, we found that some of the most horrific uses um, of uh, emotional recognition in Xinjiang, according to an Amnesty International um, investigation was actually supplied by French and Dutch companies, right? Um, and so we're not, we, we kind of like miss the, the really important question of like, what is the supply chain of these technologies and what does, you know, import and export of these technologies mean as opposed to just thinking even about design development and deployment, right? We, we got to think of it as like a consumer protection issue, as a trade issue, as a, as a data protection issue, and, and of course, as a, as a human rights issue. Um, so we're almost, I mean, actually we're exactly at the halfway point. Um, and at this point, I want to go back to our panelists and kind of, you know, having reflected on what are the challenges that we have and why they're so um, important and urgent to kind of address, I want to you know, kind of reorient the questions to what we can do um, uh, going forward um, and think about what useful and, and constructive civil society work could look like. So, um, Isa, if I could turn to you now, um, can I ask for you to share what you think are some of the arguments that could work or have work particularly well in the past when it comes to securing red lines or actually just, you know, even more broadly um, championing human rights um, in the context of EU policymaking? Uh, yes, well, uh, 
the the short answer to that is it's still a, a work in progress. So we need to see where we end up before you know um, uh, saying this has been effective or this has not been effective. I do believe that there's been there is an increasing increasing uh, uh, sensitivity to the fact that uh, we. We, meaning the European Union, as, you, as we said, could be a standard sector. And I think there is also uh, increasing attention to this fact that we can't use two different, uh, we can't set two different frameworks when it comes to European citizens within the EU and every, everywhere else. Uh, so the number of developments that are happening at the, at the EU border, for example, they're, they're getting some, some attention, especially from the civil society angle, but also, you know, they're, they're getting way more often into the headlines of, of newspapers and so on and so forth. So I think there we are sort of evolving in complexity when it comes to this uh, this perspective. And I, and I strongly believe it's the way to to go. Uh, we have uh, a variety of, of um, examples of, of um, using uh, different populations in different areas where, for example, the, the data protection regime is extremely uh, weak or not, is, is even unexistent uh, as a training uh, setting for this, the development of these technologies in a complete darkness. And this has to stop, of course. So I think there we can also, you know, uh, try to be, uh, I think we can be a little bit more optimistic. And this goes back also to this idea of trying to combine different communities. So this is for this, exactly for this reason, it's not a struggle of wide middle class people. It, it is something that, that uh, concerns ev ev everyone and every every community. And in, in, in a certain way, this is something we have already uh, tackled in a number of fights uh, when it comes to AI systems, when it comes to algorithms, uh, it is true that certain communities and certain people, they will have a, they will suffer a stronger uh, negative impact. Uh, so, uh, but I don't think we can, we can reasonably say that uh, any of us is not exposed to the risk whatsoever, especially because the majority of times what we're talking, what we're asking for a ban, we're asking, at least in, in the AI setting, uh, one of our main, main calls is, is a ban for mass surveillance. So there is very much the collective, um, generalized uh, um, impact that we're looking at, not a not, uh, specific individual or specific category. Uh, I think this idea of having, trying to, uh, have as main point, of, uh, to try to obtain a future-proof regulatory framework is going to be essential. And as uh, Daniel and Lorna, they already uh, uh, flagged, this implies a number of things and we're trying to work on, on, on a few of those. So it implies to have proper definitions. It implies to have criteria for uh, identifying what's, what's an accept, acceptable and, and what is not. Um, and I think there, it could be a successful strategy if we sort of try to use it in a, in, in a narrative that focuses on the alignment of incentives rather than on the conflicts. Um, so what I mean is, also for developers, uh, it's 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 going legal legal certainty certainty about you know what are the criteria and how this is going to work in the next years is going to create some advantages for their business cases. Um, so maybe what we could do we could try to, to um, highlight those those um, align those little areas where we have an alignment of incentives and try to call you know to be a little bit stronger in our calls. Um, another. Another uh, area where I, I sort of, uh, I see, I think I see uh, alignment of, of, of approaches is when it comes to transparency. I think we are already, you know, well advanced on that and transparency is called for by a number of stakeholders. Now, the major struggle there is going to be which kind of transparency is a sufficient and adequate transparency. So what we have in Article 16, the AI, AI, AI Act can be uh, strongly improved, I think. Uh, we're doing some work on, on that as well. But I also think that if we look at a broader picture, transparency is not something that is, is needed only in the AI Act. In Europe, this is something that is called for in a number of regulatory proposals in the DSA, in the DNA. So it's sort of, um, there, there again, we can try to figure out where synergy are in different communities that are struggling for transparency in different settings uh, and have it, you know, 
try to bring it very much as a sort of a, a, a societal struggle, way more than a specific struggle with a specific technology, because it, go, it goes well beyond that. And I think, uh, yes, uh, these, this, this could be a functional uh, strategy. Uh, for the rest, I couldn't agree more with what Lorna said, that uh, a, a possible good way to go would be to bring uh, on the surface and on the light and to give the atten all the due attention to specific individual cases. So we need to be able to have narratives and cases that speak for themselves and they are sufficiently strong and sufficiently um, uh, they gain sufficiently sufficient attention as to resist to the counter narrative that we have uh, everywhere, uh, which which is um, you know um, supported especially by the companies that are interested in developing all these these uh, technologies. Uh, and I think there uh, once again I think is a collective. Uh, action that we need to do. Uh, we at, at Article 19, we work a lot with journalists uh, and, and media outlets and activists, and I think uh, journalists will be extremely uh, sensitive to those individual stories uh, as well. So it could help, for example, to bring those stories uh, in the eyes of, of politicians or, or legislators. So I, I think there uh, we have another possibility to get in to, for our messages to get in and involve uh, a broader audience uh, because that will make uh, make a, a significant difference in the strength of our arguments, I would say. Yeah. Thank you, Isa. Um, I think, you know, related to that point of like what civil society can do and perhaps should do in the future. Um, Daniel, I wanted to turn to you and ask, especially when it comes to the risk classifications, um, because you've been, you know, so steeped in the work and you have a real pulse of how these things are moving and what works and what doesn't. Um, what kind of strategies or arguments are you hoping to see more of from civil society as well as I think equally importantly, what are you hoping to see less of in the future? Great job. So good, very good question. Um, I mean, w one thing I would totally uh, plus one to what was raised by both Isa and Lorna about the importance of personal stories. I think if we look at things like biometric categorization, you know, looking at how gender recognition is a form of that, looking at how gender recognition affects trans people, affects non-binary people, and putting those personal stories at the front. Um, I think is really key and it has to go hand in hand also with deflating the kind of marketing hype and rubbish um, because so often these systems are put forward as futuristic uh, bringing all these high-tech benefits and they're actually just about cutting costs they're like systems of austerity you know uh, AI hiring systems are used because people are cutting costs and don't want to have enough staff to properly review people, you know, and these things are always brought in to cut corners. They're not optimal solutions. And if you can burst that bubble to kind of take the shine off them, plus bring forward those personal stories that show the harm, I think that's a really, really effective um, tactic. And, and that links into, you know, what Sarah said as well, asked about how do we ensure that the red lines that really affect marginalized communities are taken seriously and it's that thing putting forward these personal stories i think is um is really key um another narrative that i think we really need to push back on is that you know especially in the parliament discussions that there's sort of extremes and that we need the moderate compromise position between them in the case of the red lines that is really really not the case you know there's no compromise position there's no I don't know, centrist dad, middle of the road, uh, objective position on systems that violate the core of fundamental rights. Like automated gender recognition can't be fixed. It can only be abusive. Uh, it totally and irrevocably undermines the rights of uh, trans non-binary people. Uh, and it needs to be banned. And there's no compromise on that. Uh, so we need to kind of stick to our guns on, on some of these positions. Uh, against the idea that there's some okay solution on them, they, they, you know, and, and that that goes in line with you know formulating the criteria about what constitutes unacceptable risk. Um, so I think that's really key. Um, I just also want to respond to one of the questions in the 
in the chat because it, it, it relates to the question you just asked me, Fidushi. Someone asked, um, the use of an AI system to infer emotions can be useful in medicine and should we have an exception for this? And this also came up in the EDPS, EDPB joint statement where they called for a ban on emotion recognition, but they asked for an exception for medical use. I think this really like gets in a nutshell the complexity of this question of defining emotion recognition, all of this, because first things first is that emotion recognition systems at the moment do not work. Um, it, there, again, there is a correlation between facial configuration and emotional state, between a smile and feeling happy. But it's not a straight one-on-one -on -one correlation. It's not strong enough to make the inference that that person is happy. Um, and it's an insufficient basis uh, for emotion recognition. We've even had, so Paul Ekman's theory on which most of these things are based is heavily criticized uh, for very good reason and there's serious doubts about it. But even Paul Ekman himself has come out in an interview with the Financial Times and said, emotion recognition technologies that use his theory are not robust. You know, he does not see his theory as a, a basis for these technological applications. So there's no basis there um, for these technologies. So the idea that we should have an exception for critical uses like medicine, which are, you know, uh, another example that's often brought up is like, I think Microsoft had a thing with their HoloLens augmented reality headset to help autistic people identify emotions of people, but it can't do that. So it's giving them incorrect information. What it could do is identify facial configurations. It could tell you the person who's looking at you is smiling, but they already know that. The problem is the inference and the technology can't help there. So the idea that this should be an exception is, is really problematic, but it again points to the, the problem of defining it. If what this person who asked the question means, or if what the EDPS, EDPB were thinking is that example that I mentioned earlier of identifying if someone calling an emergency line is having a heart attack, that's not emotion recognition. We don't need an exception if we define it properly. So, so that's really key. And I, I, I just think, um, yeah, the, especially with emotion recognition, it's easy to throw the, it's pseudoscience, it doesn't work argument out there, but we need to be careful with that because, you know, we're saying there's evidence that it doesn't work. That evidence only applies to face-based emotion recognition. There's no analogous study to Lisa Feldman's Barrett, Barrett's paper for voice-based emotion recognition. Someone should do that. We should build up the evidence, but, we, you know, we need to use our arguments correctly and make sure that our definitions are all tight so that we don't come out and then leave ourselves vulnerable to examples like someone having a heart attack while calling an emergency service. So yeah, just, I think, tight definitions, tight arguments, good references um, is going to get us over the line on, on these bands. Thank you so much, Daniel. I was reminded of, um, you know, a similar situation that we found ourselves in with respect to face recognition, where for three years, everyone just said it's not accurate, it's not accurate, without saying it's fundamentally problematic. And then we had IBM and Microsoft say, well, we've made it accurate for everyone, including black women and white men. And then we said, no, no, no the problem is actually we don't want these technologies at all. And I think um, a similar kind of risk really is facing us at the moment when it comes to newer technologies, right? That we don't have a, um, a gender shades um, equivalent to or a Lisa Feldman Barrett kind of a study um, equivalent of. So thank you so much for that. Um, and I think that, you know, you brought up this idea of like the marketing hype, right? Like efficiency um, or as, um, you know, we've also seen like national security or public safety and things like that. Um, and in that vein, I kind of I wanted to uh, turn to you, Lorna, to kind of talk about, you know, what are some of the things that we've learned from jurisdictions around the world? You know, do we get a sense of what kinds of um, arguments work well or what kinds of um, strategies are particularly compelling when we're trying to, you know, secure red lines in the face of many powerful actors who have no interest in these red lines. Um, is there anything in particular that has stuck up for you? Um, thanks, Vidushi. Um, so I think that from um, our research, many of the points that have already been made, we've, we've seen them come out within the research that we've been doing. But I think... Um, We've also seen that there's lots of structural problems that affect how um, 
how Redline's um, strategies are pursued. So um, I think the points that have come up quite a lot already um, in relation to coordination, who's in the room, plurality of voices, that has come up for us repeatedly where um, different people have said, you know, it's really challenging to pursue red lines, particularly when you don't have strong data protection and strong safeguards already in place. Because if you try to pursue this, there is a risk that you may just be completely shut out of the conversation. Um, it may just seem too radical, um, a step too far. Um, and so there, there's a real concern around um, if you pursue that, you don't get to be part of, of the conversation. And we already know that there's a real democratic deficit in terms of who participates in these regulation, regulation and governance conversations. So I think that we have to think about, you know, how, how have we managed to get to a place where, you know, six, seven years ago, it was very difficult to make human rights arguments in this space. But now we're at a point where we've really um, had great achievements in centralising human rights, even if it's just often feeling quite rhetorical um, within these conversations about AI regulation. So how do we make red lines not seem a radical, um, but normalise it as something that needs to be squarely within regulation conversations? And critically, how do we build... Um, on the call for dealing with this democratic de deficit to ensure that there's a plurality of voices always in the room so that there can be these conversations really um, taking place and that people um, don't need to have to feel concerned about pursuing these arguments um, and then being shut out. So I think that that's one big thing that has come out for us. Um, I think the other um, big thing that has come out is, is as you said, Vijushi, going beyond technical errors and talking about wider acceptability. Um, but I think that what we have seen um, is that people, you know, repeatedly raising how difficult it is to talk about red lines in the face of security um, and dealing with crime. And so crime and insecurity being um, very difficult overcoming ideas that biometric technologies may be a way in which to make us feel safer. Um, and I think to be able to deal with that big obstacle, um, it's not enough just to focus on the technology and the problems of the technology, but we'll really have to locate this within this much bigger um, idea that human rights um, can be dispensed with when you're trying to deal with security and, and crime issues um, and really get at the heart of the of the um, the way in which law enforcement and security can be pursued at the expense of human rights and particularly structural and institutional discrimination that can come out of that and to then show how um, biometric technologies in these contexts can accentuate and add new dimensions to these problems. Um, so I think um, really trying to, to locate technologies within these problems I think has come out as something that's really important um, to address. Um, and then just maybe the last point has been the importance of dealing with multi-layered strategies. So we're talking a lot here about formal regulation in the context of the EUI Act. Um, but what has come out from our, from our research is also, you know, when is it the right time to use courts? Um, and, you know, Issa talked about the, some, maybe some of the challenges with that, um, but sometimes litigation will be a really important precursor or the really important route. But also thinking about other actors like investors being a really important forum for influencing um, how red lines are pursued. So um, really trying to think about the different levels um, of regulation and governance and different points in which we can resist um, the, the use of these technologies. But I'll stop here because I think we're, we're running short on time. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Lana. That's a lot of food for thought. And I think what I was struck by when you when you were talking about, you know, how insecurity and, and um, kind of safety related, uh, you know, um, 
issues kind of warrant almost an exception, which is quite ironic because the safeguards that we have and the standards of proportionality and necessity actually exist for that very situation, but they're abandoned exactly then. Um, so thank you so much to um, to our panelists. We have 10 minutes. We're going to be going five minutes over um, the stipulated time, if that's okay. Um, I just wanted to make sure that we answered all of the questions um, that we have in the chat. Um, I think, uh, Daniel, you kind of answered Sarah's questions about, um, you know, whether we will be able to successfully mobilize as a community against those deadlines, which primarily are targeted against relatively underrepresented uh, groups. Um, Isa and Lorna, did you want to jump in on that particular question? Sorry, Vidushi, which, which kind of question do you want to address? Sorry, I just, I'm, I'm opening the chat now. I'm seeing it's pretty active. No, that's, yeah, it's, it's, it's gotten very active at the moment, which is great. Um, so Sarah asked, um, I'd be interested to know how far the panelists feel we will be able to successfully mobilize as a community against those red lines, which primarily are targeted against relatively underrepresented groups in digital rights communities, such as racialized and people and migrants. Um, you touched upon this a little bit in your intervention, Isa, but I'd love to hear um, more. Uh, yes, so I, I do believe, for example, that it, uh, this, this um, uh, one of the most uh, convincing arguments is where we look at it at, outside the European Union context, which is by definition, you know, uh, looking at a diverse, uh, at a more diverse environment. Uh, and, um, I, I, you know, it, it, it's once again, it's, uh, it's um, uh, uh, an element that we have with uh, the AI uh, uh, systems, not only in the within the framework of the AI Act, but also when we talk about, you know, many of us are involved in the content moderation uh, discussions as well. And there, it's it. So the way I picture it is uh, that. Um, the, there are certain categories, always there will be certain categories that will suffer more harm than others, right? Uh, it doesn't really need to refrain us from, but what we are reasoning about here is not uh, uh, whether, you know, we are we can accept a system uh, that creates those trade-offs and harms for X percentage of society, and then the, the another percentage is safe. So we're not discussing about, you know, if 50 plus 1 percent of society is safe, then we are okay with this. It's not this, this sort of proportionality test that we need to apply. The point is uh, for each and every individual, because we, what we're talking about is human rights and, and human rights uh, apply to each and every individual everywhere we are. So to each and every individual is this proportionate and necessary, this kind of violation. So what I would, would uh, use in terms of, you know, the, the, the narrative the, in order to in order to to make clear that we're very much all in the same boat is this one, and not to forget that um, the moment the the moment a, a specific technology is designed and deployed, it's extremely the kind of harm that that could uh, um, that could create. Um, or generate, it's extremely context dependent, can be extremely context dependent. So this can be linked to the, uh, I don't know, the, the um, economic context, but especially, but also the political one. So those, vari those are vari variables, right? And you can, uh, even within the EU, you can have uh, different different approaches uh, to those specific technologies or how they're going to be used in practice. Uh, so I don't think uh, what we need to think of is how to protect specific categories. We need to to sort of figure out a system that has sufficient guarantees and as, and when it comes sufficient bans uh, to sort of eliminate um, to the extent possible uh, any 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 risk whatsoever and not to be uh, linked to you know okay it's okay because the majority of people there are going to be better off it's okay because we trust the political system in place in this specific environment and so on and so forth so I would I would go for a completely different uh, scenario and there I think uh, we can we can easily create exploit and and focus on the synergies uh, among the different communities rather than than the differences. Um, yeah, and if I if I can just um, uh, very very quickly come back to a point that was raised so far, uh, I do agree that uh, a number of these things come up uh, with litigation, and I do also agree that the difference in in for example the data protection framework that you have in Africa is um, is going to uh, is going to be a game changer. But I would warn, this is not a data protection fight. 
not only a data protection fight. So when we talk about, you know, risks and when we talk about red lines, we are talking about human rights and there are way more human rights to add, to be added in the list of what we, we, you know, we need to safeguard here. So the simple fact in brackets, simple, that we have a good data protection framework, uh, it's not gonna be, uh, make us safe. And that's why we as a collective, and I don't know many of us have done that. We have always, we're pushing for this idea of human rights impact assessment, not only data protection assessment, impact assessments because this is not a cap this is not going to capture the entire story um yeah thank you thank you isa um we have two uh remaining questions one i mean each of which i'm going to uh, post to lorna and danielle um if i could request you to keep your answers to about two and a half minutes that would be great um uh so Lorna, uh, we have a question that says, I'm currently looking at transnational issues and, there is, and is there sufficient agreement on what human rights uh, values we share? I have analyzed various proposals and they often refer to this as being uncontested. Is this the case? I realize this is a bit outside the wheelhouse of our current conversation, but I do think it's an important, um, you know, kind of foundational question and assumption to be uh, to, to, for us to discuss. Sorry, Vidici, did you want me to answer that or Daniel or both? Uh, Lona, it would be great if you could answer that. Yeah, yeah, no. sure. Um, so I'm not very sure which um, proposals um, are being referred to, but I think that certainly when we've looked at um, different national AI strategies, for example, um, there are different approaches to how human rights are referred to. So sometimes we find only some individual human rights are referred to. Um, sometimes human rights are referred to generally, um, but the um, requirements of, say, accountability and remedies and oversight are not there. So um, it's certainly true that human rights are sort of used in, um, in different ways um, in national AI strategies and not always comprehensively. Um, but I think that for our work, where we start with, um, you know, our t taking um, human rights in, in the round is derived from um, international and regional human rights treaties, looking at civil and political and economic, social and cultural um, human rights as sort of the universal understanding um, of what those rights are and also the, um, the obligations on states and responsibilities of businesses that attach um, to them. So, um, and I, I think that's where most people um, are starting with when they're having this conversation. But I think there are big risks that, um, that we focus only on certain rights and therefore miss the full human rights impact um, and the intersecting human rights impact um, and intersecting forms of discrimination um, that are often coming up. Um, when we too narrowly focus on, on one right. I think sort of the better way to look at it is even if there is a particular impact on a right like freedom of expression or privacy, to really think through, well, what are the consequences for other human rights um, if those rights are, are violated? And I think when you do that, then you will often see the right to liberties at stake, the right to education. You see um, intersecting forms of discrimination, um, as I said, um, so I think really thinking about it fully um, in the round of the international and regional treaties and critically thinking about what the obligations of prevention are, accountability, access to justice, remedies, um, oversight, and, and as Lisa said, um, human rights impact assessments um, and other tools to identify and address human rights risks as they arise. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lorna. Um, in the interest of time, I'm going to quickly turn to you, Daniel. There's a question that says, um, wondering what the panelists think of the argument that we are holding AI systems to a higher degree of accuracy than we do not, uh, that we do not apply to humans. For example, judges can be biased too and are often not transparent in how they decide. Um, which I think is is the question that we've we come across quite often in our work, Daniel. I'd love to to hear you weigh in on that one. Sure, thanks. Yeah, I mean, I whenever people bring up judges, I, I usually assume that they're thinking of the famous, infamous Israeli judges study, where like these judges were shown to rule in a much uh, more negative way when they were hungry before lunch or something. And that that study has been, I think, pretty conclusively 
uh, debunked. It's not a good study to base any arguments on. And I would also, I mean, the first thing I'd like to do to deflate that question a bit is to say that there's not a distinction between humans and AI systems. There's humans using AI systems to do things and we're holding them to high standards. We're not holding AIs. So it's, it's again, it's a bit that problem of kind of personification, anthropomorphization of of the systems that we're holding them to standards. No, we're holding the companies developing them. We're holding the public authority using an AI system to determine access to social welfare to a high standard. Um, and we should hold them all to high standards. You know, we should have uh, transparency. And yeah, I mean, it fits in a bit with that problematic argument that, oh, we're, we have a problem with AI black boxes, but humans are black boxes too. And yeah, I, I think all of those arguments fall down a bit when you sort of unpack a bit um, who who you're actually talking about there. Um, so I, I think we should, you know, and again, just to, to come back to the original question, these people who are promoting AI solutions are touting them as better than humans. <laughs> and so we should hold them to a high standard. And then I find that often the, the conversation goes that they're promoted in the marketing material as absolutely optimum, super futuristic, amazing, the best solution ever. And then you criticize them and they say, oh, but actually we're just automating an existing crappy, imperfect human process and you shouldn't hold us to a high standard. So they, they tend to flip from kind of one, one to the other very quickly. And yeah, sorry, uh, we will hold them to high standards and doing that doesn't preclude that we also hold existing uh, fully human-based institutions to high standards. Um, you know, there's a full spectrum of civil society, human rights activist work, and it involves holding all aspects and all consequential decisions and actors to the high bar of human rights uh, compliance. Thank you, Daniel, and what a great note uh, on which we can end our panel. Uh, thank you so much to all the panelists. We've run out of time and gone a little bit over, so my apologies to the organizers, but if anything, it's always a good sign when uh, we have more questions than time. But um, I just wanted to say thank you so much to our panelists again. This has been a fascinating conversation, and thank you to all our participants and Edry for having us. <laughs>